Picture a grand Parisian chateau, 1847, nestled in the heart of the city. The tranquility of the night is abruptly shattered by a horrifying shriek that echoes through the silent corridors. As the household stirs, a blood-curdling scene awaits the servants. Duchess of choiseul Praslin, a woman of great elegance and stature, is found brutally murdered in her bedroom. Her body bears the grisly testament of a violent struggle that leaves her unrecognizable, a sight no servant should ever have to witness. Amidst this horrific tableau, the Duke of choiseul Praslin remains eerily calm, his behavior a stark contrast to the gruesome scene that has unfolded. His face is a mask of calm, his eyes show no signs of shock or grief, as though he were merely an observer of the horror that played out. His actions, devoid of panic or despair, but filled with eerie nonchalance, suggest something more sinister. As dawn breaks and the sun casts an eerie glow over the Grand Chateau, the Duke, seemingly unaffected, instructs his servants to clean up, setting the stage for one of the 19th century's most scandalous crime tales. Behind the splendor of the noble title, the Duke and Duchess's marital bond was far from flawless. Charles and Fanny, the Duke and Duchess de choiseau Praslin, found themselves caught in a relentless cycle of estrangement and contention. The Duke's various infidelities and his escalating fondness for the children's governess, Henriette de Luzy de Sport, only intensified the underlying marital discord. The Duchess, however, had written in her diary many times about how deeply in love with the Duke she was. Sensing her husband was having an affair, the Duchess fired the maid, and refused a letter of recommendation for future employment. That made the scandalous connection between the Duke and Henriette further push the couple to the fringe of their social circles, paving the way for a tragic demise of the Duchess. Amidst these tumultuous events, the Duke's affection for Henriette further inflamed the already raging inferno. On the night of the 18th of August, 1847, the simmering tension reached its climax. Charles de Choiseul, the Duke of Praslin, is alleged to have assaulted his wife, leading to her brutal demise. The details of this assault remain murky, concealed within the turbulent dynamics of their relationship and their opulent residence. What is known is that the Duchess was discovered in a horrendous condition. Her life cruelly ended within the confines of her private quarters. Before the Duchess was found, several servants told detectives they heard loud screams and a gunshot. The Duke was quickly apprehended, a somber shroud of suspicion looming heavily over him. The masses were aghast by the brutal end of the Duchess, a member of high society renowned for her refinement and allure. The French aristocracy was plunged into chaos, their dazzling veneer broken by this horrific act. The Duke, previously a reputable politician and noble, was now the main character in a terrifying saga, his reputation stained by his wife's blood. Upon entering the crime scene, it was patent to the investigators that a struggle had ensued. The Duchess was draped across the couch, her head lying in a pool of her own blood. Her neck had been mangled and shot. Clutched in her hands were strands of hair she pulled during the assault, which matched the Duke's length and color. Adding to the suspicion, a trail of blood was found, leading from the Duchess's room back to the Duke's, and his pistol was found near the Duchess's body, her red stains remaining on the butt of the pistol where she was struck. The Duke was immediately charged and placed on house arrest until his trial where he was diligently monitored. However, on the night he was transferred to the Luxembourg Palace to start the trial, he imbibed several vials of arsenic and was found on the floor, life barely clinging to the body. Doctors arrived quickly and administered a strong emetic to counteract the poison, seemingly saving the Duke's life. But in the end, the poison had seeped too deep, and a few days later, the Duke died. Like any sensational crime narrative, the downfall of the Duke and Duchess was a hotbed for speculation and conspiracy theories. The shocking death of Charles de Choiseul, Duke of Praslin, and his Duchess created ripples through the fabric of French society, igniting a spark of rumors that soon evolved into comprehensive theories. One enduring theory that continues to fascinate suggests that the Duke, in a bid to evade the public scandal, didn't end his own life, but rather staged his death. The plot thickens with murmurs of the Duke's supposed secret escape to Central America, specifically Nicaragua. An unusual choice, one might opine, yet for a man pressed to slip away from the grips of scandal, perhaps it was remote enough. The conspiracy extends beyond a mere disappearance. Some theorists propose that the Duke lived the remainder of his life under a disguise, 
a shadow of his preceding self, eternally stalked by his haunting history. A thrilling story, certainly, but one bereft of solid proof. Yet the charm of such a dramatic getaway continues to engage the mind's eye. Another more plausible theory arose, pinning the murder on the former governess of the Duchess with the Duke ending his life out of grief or perhaps poisoned by the same maiden on a secret overnight rendezvous. Which theory do you think holds the most weight? Taking a step away from the conspiracy theories, the repercussions of the Duke and Duchess's demise on French society were profound and widespread. The scandal triggered by their tumultuous relationship and violent demise played a pivotal role in the collapse of the July monarchy. The subsequent public fury and unrest acted as a catalyst, fanning the fire of the 1848 revolution. The Duke's demise, whether self-inflicted or a meticulously planned deceit, was a turning point in French history. The scandal-ridden end of the couple served as a potent reminder of the explosive relationship between the nobility and the general public, a relationship that was on the brink of an irreversible transformation. Thus, the Duke and Duchess of choiseau praslin both in life and death, remained at the crux of one of France's most scandalous and influential crime narratives. This cryptic entity, Marcel Francisci, a persona veiled in mystery, illicit actions, and influence. Born on the 30th of November, 1919, Francisci's life was anything but ordinary. His story takes root in the tumultuous period of World War II. As a brave young man, he earned the prestigious Croix de Guerre, a French military honor, marking his first foray into a life of audacity and authority. However, peace did not mean the end of his battles. Instead, it signaled the commencement of a fresh chapter for him. Swapping the trenches for boardrooms, Francisci constructed an expansive business empire that spanned the globe. His casinos thrived in multiple countries, with his name becoming synonymous with high-stakes gambling and the glitz and glamour of the casino world. However, behind the scenes, Francisci was spinning a darker web. His ties with the Corsican underworld, a notorious crime syndicate, were no secret. He used these connections to expand his influence not just in the underworld realm, but also in politics, where he became a member of the conservative Gaullist party. Marcel Francisci was a man of many faces, each one seamlessly more dubious than the previous. His life was also marred by violence, possibly an echo of his time in the war. He was embroiled in mob conflicts in southern France, a perilous dance with mortality that he navigated with an innate sense of survival. A significant feud with a rival mob family cemented his stature in the criminal world, while simultaneously multiplying his enemies. Francisci, hero turned mob boss, found himself ensnared in a complex web of crime and power games. His life demonstrates that power, once tasted, becomes a compelling addiction, but his ascent to power was fraught with danger and treachery. Stay tuned as we delve deeper into the enigma that is Marcel Francisci, exploring his rise to power and the deadly battles he fought along the way. His moniker became synonymous with a notorious narcotics ring, the French Connection. This was not a label to be borne lightly. The French Connection was a major infamous enterprise that enabled the trafficking of heroin between Marseille, France, and the United States. It was a syndicate that prospered on secrecy, violence, and the relentless quest for power. Marcel Francisci, the war hero turned tycoon, found himself in the vortex of this operation. His moniker was murmured in muted voices as a pivotal player in this perilous game. After returning from the war, Francisci honed his skills in smuggling, gambling, and navigating the treacherous waters of the underworld with aid from his mentor, Joe Renucci, who recruited him into the Mafia. Thanks to several key connections, Francisci was appointed as the head of the Gaullist party in Corsica. After Renucci's death in 1958, Francisci took complete control, inheriting the empire of one of the world's largest heroin trafficking operations. With his new role in revenue streams, he quickly began building casinos across Europe, earning him a well-known title as Emperor of Games. With his rapid rise and expansion, he realized his competition needed to be terminated. The Guarinis, a well-established family with smuggling ties through Turkey and a list of casinos, became the next wall for Francisci to climb. This family feud began its first underworld war in 1963, with another following quickly in 1965. The third war was waged after the assassination of Antoine Guarini, head of the family, in 1967. He was gunned down at a gas station by two members on motorcycles in broad daylight. The audacity of the assassination sparked an explosive counterattack. 
shortly after Francisci was targeted by a sniper when leaving a Gaulist party rally in Ajaccio, Corsica. A few days later, two members of the Gorini family were extinguished when the 220 pounds of TNT they tried to plant backfired and exploded prematurely. Another attempt at his life happened the following year when five men entered the restaurant where Francisci was dining and opened fire. Miraculously, Francisci survived unscathed. In the aftermath of the failed assassinations, Francisci would get his revenge in one fell swoop. At a bar in Paris, a man disguised as an officer was able to infiltrate and gun down the remaining heads of the Garini family, leaving Francisci in control of the entire Corsica region. This was a realm where the stakes were high and the repercussions even higher. The French connection enabled the smuggling of heroin from Indochina through Marseille all the way to the United States. It was a finely tuned apparatus, stage managed by the Corsican Mafia, and Francisci was indicted of being its head maestros. The operation was pitiless, leaving a path of violence and devastation in its aftermath. Despite the gravity of these indictments, Francisci managed to uphold a facade of respectability. Thanks to his political affairs in the public eye, he was still a philanthropist and man of the people. In the criminal realm, foes are inevitable, and he was not immune. The harsh reality of balancing life on the precipice was an all-too-common reality for Marcel Francisci. This was a man who not only braved the nightmares of World War II, but also endured several murder bids. Francisci was well acquainted with peril. His participation in the infamous French Connection drug syndicate and his bonds with the Corsican Mafia marked him as a prime target. Coupled with his standing in the Gaullist party and his supremacy over a casino empire, you have a man treading on a knife's edge. But in spite of these bids, Francisci remained resolute. He continued his operations, living each day as if it were his last. Francisci's story serves as a bleak reminder of the perilous game he was embroiled in. A game where the risks were colossal and the competitors were cutthroat. A game where survival was not assured and death was perpetually lurking in the shadows. But as they say, everyone has a bullet with their name on it. On that fateful day in January 1982, the gunshot destined for Francisci eventually found him. Marcel Francisci, a venerated warrior who transitioned into a notorious criminal, met his tragic demise in a Parisian parking lot. The infamous figure, a key player in the so-called French Connection Narcotics Syndicate, was shot to death just outside of his car along with his driver who was shot four times in the head and chest. A chilling coda to a life steeped in controversy and danger. Francisci's demise resonated with enigmatic conditions, as did the man himself. Despite the high-profile stature of the victim, the unresolved status of the double murder persists to this day. Who fired the shots? What was their incentive? These lingering queries continue to perplex investigators and crime enthusiasts alike, supplementing layer to the mystery that was Francisci. The theories were endless, ranging from retaliation of a remaining Guarini member to someone in his own circle looking to replace the Emperor of Games. With reports of the trafficking in the U.S. growing so rapidly, some have speculated a murder plot at the highest levels of foreign government. But in the absence of solid proof, these remain sheer conjectures. The roster of potential culprits is extensive. From discontented business associates to rival mobsters to political foes, the array of individuals who might have harbored animosity towards Francisci is far-reaching. The identity of Francisci's assassin continues to lurk in obscurity, akin to the covert operations he himself was allegedly conducting. In spite of the passage of time, the case retains its allure. He, a figure of multiple facets, bequeathed a heritage as intricate as his existence. Marcel Francisci was an enigma, a figure who traversed the line between dignity and illegality. His existence was a mosaic of paradoxes with strands of valor and benevolence intermixed with those of structured delinquency and brutality. Notwithstanding his purported involvement in the infamous French connection, Francisci is commemorated by many in his native Corsica for his benevolent acts. He was a champion of the needy, a supporter of the underprivileged, a man who utilized his affluence to alleviate the struggles of others. Yet the ghost of his criminal indictments cast a significant shadow over his benevolence. Francisci's moniker is eternally associated with the French Connection, a narcotics network that spanned from the poppy terrains of Indochina to the lanes of the United States. His alleged participation in this syndicate has intrigued real crime aficionados for years, an intrigue ignited by the unresolved nature of his assassination. 
Francisci's demise in 1982, shot down in a Parisian parking area, was a brutal conclusion to an existence marked by violence, yet his assassination persists as an unsolved case, a riddle as baffling as the man himself. Who assassinated Marcel Francisci? What drove them? These queries continue to baffle the world. He was a war hero, an entrepreneur, a statesman, a mobster, and a benefactor. Each of these facets contributes to the complexity of his heritage, rendering him a figure of perpetual curiosity. In death, as in life, Marcel Francisci remains a charismatic figure of mystery and fascination. Despite the darkness that shrouded his life, his benevolent efforts illuminate a different aspect of his persona, disclosing a man who was more than merely a criminal. Joanna Marie Parrish, a name echoing hauntingly in many memories, was a British tutor with an undying love for languages. A fervent student whose life was brimming with prospects, Joanna's bright future was brutally snuffed out in her prime. Her choice to work in France, submerging herself in its culture to broaden her vistas, stood as a testament to her adventurous spirit. Joanna found herself in Auxerre, a picturesque French town steeped in history. Unbeknownst to her, this charming town was to be the setting of her untimely demise. It was here in 1990 that Joanna's corpse was found in a river, causing a surge of worldwide dismay. A youthful existence was abruptly stolen, leaving an aftermath of unanswered questions and a thirst for retribution. The discovery sent ripples of alarm not only through the tight-knit community of Auxerre, but also across the world. The news of a young British woman brutally slain in a foreign land served as a stark reminder of the lurking darkness beneath the veneer of our daily lives. At just 20 years old, this university student had dreams and ambitions her entire life ahead of her all ruthlessly taken away in a heinous act that instilled a bone-chilling fear. Joanna's narrative, spanning over three decades, is more than just a tale of a life cut short. It's a persistent battle for retribution that involves numerous suspects, including a convicted serial killer, a story marred by lost DNA evidence, investigative delays, and the unwavering drive of a bereaved family seeking resolution. Join us as we delve further into this gruesome and untimely death. Let's journey back to the 16th of May, 1990. The beautiful town of Auxerre is brimming and bustling with people walking and shopping in the historic streets. Joanna Parrish, a young and eager student at the University of Leeds, was only one week away from completing her third year. As part of her year three requirements, she needed a sandwich course or internship to complete her credits. To supplement her income while working as an intern, she decided to teach English on the side. Little did she know that same ambition to teach others would be her final lesson. An appointment to meet had been scheduled that night at 7 p.m. outside of the Bank Populaire in Auxerre. Her flatmate told the investigators that a man called to set up the tutoring lessons for his son. That would be the last time anyone saw Joanna. The following day, Joanna's body was found in the River Yon. News of her death hit the headlines and spread like wildfire. Local detectives quickly jumped into action. The preliminary phase of the investigation buzzed with heightened activity. French authorities, joining forces with their British counterparts, commenced the reconstruction of Joanna's last tragic moments. Their goal was to capture a murderer, but they were met with scant clues and a ticking clock. The chilling question was, who could have orchestrated such a monstrous act? Joanna Marie Parrish, the brilliant British language student and tutor, was immersed in fostering cultural connections through language at a local school when her existence was brutally cut short. Within the core of the investigation, a perverse narrative of a mass murderer and his partner in crime gradually came to light. Enter Michel Fourneret, a name soon to be intertwined with the case. A convicted serial killer, Fourneret was one of the main culprits in the murder. His sinister past and streak of violence marked him as an individual of interest to the detectives. His wife, Monique Olivier, was likewise associated with the case. Together, they appeared to dwell at the heart of a nefarious network that had taken Joanna as its recent victim. The British police also had a significant role in the investigation with French authorities underlining the gravity of the case and the resolve to bring the wrongdoers to justice. However, as the case unfolded, it was evident that it was far from straightforward. Due to the heinous nature of Joanna's death, Michel Fourneret seemed the likely culprit based on the other homicides in which he was involved. Not only had Joanna been beaten, raped, and strangled to death, but her body bore the same ominous puncture wounds that all of Fourneret's other victims endured. 
However, when the critical DNA evidence taken from her naked body that washed up on the riverbank disappeared, any physical proof of his guilt vanished with it. The chase for justice was a race against the clock, filled with impediments at every juncture. Yet the journey towards justice was far from smooth, marred by mistakes, postponements, and a startling disclosure. After months and months of inquiries without convictions, the case for Joanna had gone cold. It would be almost 20 years after her untimely demise when a glimmer of hope would re-emerge for the family. In 2008, a man dubbed the Beast of Ardennes, AKA Michel Fournier, was convicted of seven murders across a staggering 14-year period from 1987 to 2001. All seven women bore the same brutal ending as young Joanna. Yet without any physical proof, justice for Joanna remained elusive. The case stagnated and was dismissed in 2011 due to the absence of concrete evidence. Yet in 2012, the reinvestigation breathed new life into the pursuit of justice for Joanna. A witness came forward. Monique Olivier, the Beast's wife, made a claim that she saw him come home one night with scratches on his face and a bag that matched the description of Joanna's. Yet again, the case hit a brick wall when she recanted her statement under the guise of duress. This was not simply another murder investigation, but a chilling descent into the realm of mass murders, a tangled maze of deceit and betrayal. In 2012, the case went cold once more and was closed. Fast track to 2018, a ray of light pierced the dark veil looming over Joanna's demise. Michel Fournier, an infamous serial killer, finally admitted to Joanna's murder. However, before he could stand trial and be brought to justice, death claimed him first. Fournier's passing before his trial left a myriad of unresolved queries and lingering nightmares. Joanna's family was again faced with disappointment. Finally, when all hope for justice seemed lost, the last piece of the puzzle fell into place. Following years of torment, Joanna's family found themselves on the brink of retribution. It was the year 2023. The courtroom was buzzing with anticipation as Monique Olivier, the wife of a convicted serial killer who had confessed to Joanna's murder, faced trial. Monique Olivier, implicated by her late husband, Michel Fournier, in several of his chilling crimes was no stranger to the legal system. Yet this trial was distinct confronting her direct involvement in the murder of Joanna Parrish. The compelling proof against Olivier was undeniable, and her conviction appeared certain. However, the journey to this verdict was riddled with complications. Missteps, mishandled evidence, and overlooked opportunities marred the investigation. The loss of vital DNA evidence was a devastating blow to Joanna's family, a harsh reminder of the bureaucratic inefficiencies that had obstructed their quest for retribution. The most significant hindrances were the delays, identifying Fournier, bringing him to trial, and then proceeding with Olivier. Each delay was a harsh wound, magnifying the grief that Joanna's family bore. Despite these hindrances, Joanna's family displayed steadfast commitment. Their pursuit of justice for Joanna was a beacon of hope within the grim context of this case. They braved the turmoil of the trial, the twists and turns, the disappointments and triumphs, with an admirable grace and resilience. Ultimately, their tenacity bore fruit. In 2023, Monique Olivier was convicted for her involvement in Joanna's murder, triggering a wave of mixed emotions in the courtroom, with a sense of relief washing over Joanna's family. Justice, in this case, had been a taxing journey, symbolizing the unyielding quest for veracity. Joanna Parrish's tale extends beyond a felony, it exemplifies the fortitude of her family and their steadfast quest for retribution. The somber circumstances of Joanna's case, dominated by the loss of DNA evidence and protracted legal proceedings, achieved a glimmer of redemption in 2023. Monique Olivier, widow of the late Michel Fournier, who confessed to the crime in 2018, was implicated and condemned for her participation in Joanna's murder. This conviction symbolized more than a mere sentence. It represented a hard-earned retribution for Joanna's family, a glint of optimism in their relentless pursuit for justice spanning decades. The influence of Joanna's case expands beyond legal parameters. It serves as an eerie memento of the prolonged battle for justice, of a family's fortitude that defied the tragic loss of their daughter. In the wake of an unthinkable act, Joanna's story reverberates, an eerie memento of an existence abruptly ended and hard-earned retribution. The year is 1984. A peaceful French hamlet begins like any other day, but a young boy playing in his front yard vanishes without a trace. In the quiet Vosges region, four-year-old Gregory Villemain 
disappeared from the garden where he was playing. Fraught with panic and fear, his mother contacted the local police to report his absence. Later that evening, Gregory's uncle received a phone call that the boy had been taken and dumped in the Volange River. To their horror, his lifeless body was discovered that night by local authorities. This innocent existence abruptly ended, leaving a terrifying emptiness. His lifeless body's discovery shocked the close-knit community like a ruthless sudden storm. The unthinkable occurred, leaving behind lasting echoes in the hushed lanes. Yet this was no typical homicide. The events around Gregory's demise were veiled in a dark, ominous mystery. Fear had been inching towards the Vilmian family well before the horrific incident. Unknown letters, cryptic threats, a quiet phone call, each an eerie foreshadowing of the looming disaster. For almost three years prior to Gregory's abduction and murder, the family received several letters and phone calls from a mysterious man threatening revenge on his father, Jean-Marie, for some unknown transgression. These were no idle threats. The anonymous tormentor, later dubbed The Crow, from an earlier production called La Corbeau, was no benign jester. His eerie messages carried his lethal promises. One such letter, I have taken revenge, was a chilling premonition tragically realized. The ordinary life of the Villemain in a typical French hamlet was disrupted by constant threats and their son's brutal murder. Their existence transformed into a tale of terror, doubt, and despair. The peaceful village was permanently disrupted, resulting in a haunting enigma that has perplexed France till now. Far from a mere crime, Gregory Villemin's murder became a public horror, turning personal grief into a national nightmare. A young boy, Gregory, taken before he could begin primary school, was found on the river bank of Valogne, his hands and wrists bound with a rope and a woolen hat pulled down over his face. The inquiry into Gregory Villemin's homicide rapidly devolved into a maze of accusations and detentions, giving birth to the infamous Gregory affair. The authorities found themselves entrenched in a swamp of misdirections and personal feuds, with the line between suspects and victims becoming increasingly unclear. Numerous detentions were made, implicating even those within Gregory's inner circle. Handwriting experts initially suspected Jean-Marie's cousin, Bernard Laroche, as the crow, which led to his arrest. Backed by the statement from his sister-in-law, Muriel Bull, it appeared the culprit was captured. However, Bull would later recant her statement, saying she was coerced by detectives to make the claim. Laroche vehemently rejected the accusations of being the crow or having any involvement in Gregory's death. He was released several months later. The Villaman clan was plunged into turmoil, trust eroded amongst kin. Refusing the outcome, Jean-Marie promised revenge against Laroche publicly. Two months after Laroche was released, Jean-Marie made good on his promise by shooting Laroche to death as he was leaving work. Miraculously, Gregory's father was sentenced to only five years for the murder of Laroche and released after two and a half years for good behavior. Not long after Jean-Marie took his revenge, handwriting experts turned their gaze on the mother, Christina, as the potential culprit of her own son's death. After months of grueling hardships and pressure from police, she was released, but not before succumbing to the stress and miscarrying one of the twins she was pregnant with during the investigation. Adding to the turmoil, the presiding judge succumbed to suicide, showing the heavy psychological burden of the pursuit. Anonymously penned letters only deepened the mystery, their menacing contents and enigmatic hints leading back to the Villamine household. Despite the myriad twists, feuds, and misdirections, the elusive nature of truth remained a consistent feature of the investigation. The case represented a complex puzzle lacking clear direction and missing crucial pieces. As the years rolled by, the case grew frigid and the truth further out of reach, with Gregory's murder remaining unresolved. Despite their best attempts, authorities have yet to close the case of Gregory Villemin, the four-year-old victim of circumstance, marking it as one of France's most notorious unresolved mysteries. Despite numerous dead ends, the pursuit for justice for Gregory Villemin persisted relentlessly. With the passage of time, the case refused to vanish into the archives of overlooked crimes. It stayed as a lingering enigma, a mystery craving to be decoded. Over the years, the unyielding search for truth unveiled new evidence and breakthroughs. The French judiciary, unhindered by time, decided to revisit the case, scrutinizing it through the lens of technological progress and advanced investigation methods. This revamped focus led to a closer examination of the anonymous letters, the veiled threats that once rattled the Villamin family. 
The deployment of advanced crime analysis software marked a significant shift in the investigation. Employing a blend of artificial intelligence and criminal psychology, this tool probed the case from a novel angle, scrutinizing overlooked nuances from the initial probe. A unique stylometric technique was introduced as part of this rejuvenated strategy, enabling the identification of a potential suspect via handwriting analysis. Swiss experts equipped with this method pinpointed a few suspects. In June 2017, three new arrests were made in the case. The suspects, more relatives of the young boy taken too soon. Gregory's great aunt and uncle, along with an aunt, the widow of Michel Villemin, were taken into custody. Muriel Boll was detained too, but released within 36 hours. His aunt was let go several days later. However, the great aunt and uncle invoked their right to remain silent. Eventually, they were released too. These continued debacles of justice, along with inconclusive DNA evidence tested from the rope used to bind young Gregory, dragged the investigation further into the abyss. The case had witnessed multiple arrests and dismissed charges, and the path to justice was strewn with misdirects and disillusionment. Nevertheless, the relentless search for truth persevered. The case of Gregory Villemin, with its tangled maze of leads and disputes, continues to baffle. Resembling a chilling crime novel, the pursuit of truth endures, driven by the hope that one day the truth will be unveiled. Gregory Villemin's murder has evolved beyond a mere crime. It's a chilling saga of loss, treachery, and a relentless search for truth. This heart-rending incident has left a lasting impact on France. The unresolved enigma of a four-year-old boy's brutal killing has gripped the nation with intrigue, fury, and profound grief. It has become ingrained in the nation's psyche, a grim tale revisited repeatedly. Notably, the Gregory affair has grown beyond traditional criminal probes, inspiring numerous documentaries and a French miniseries. These narratives, while illuminating the case, expose the complex dynamics of crime investigations, showcasing how they can be tainted by familial disputes, wrongful allegations, and procedural errors. The Gregory Affair illustrates the hurdles often encountered in the quest for justice. Multiple arrests and releases, inconclusive genetic tests, anonymous threats. All these elements contribute to a convoluted probe fraught with obstacles. Nevertheless, they underscore the unwavering dedication of those persisting in their search for truth, even four decades later. Furthermore, the case has propelled progress in crime analysis with the latest efforts employing cutting-edge technologies like advanced software and stylometrics, a method that scrutinizes writing styles. These strides, spurred by Gregory's case, hold promise for transforming crime investigations in the future. Exploring Gregory Villamin's tragic narrative reminds us that each crime harbors a human tragedy, an enduring search for justice, and a mystery that continues to perplex us. What's the current status of the Gregory Villamin case, four decades after the horrific incident? The unnerving saga remains perplexing and enigmatic, a blend of fascination and sorrow. Though the mystery is yet to be solved, the inquiry is not static. Quite the contrary, the gears of justice continue their motion, albeit at a slow pace. Emerging evidence infuses renewed vigor into this vintage case. With technological advancements, DNA findings are now scrutinized rigorously, generating new avenues and provoking fresh queries. The deployment of state-of-the-art crime analysis tools, together with the recognition of a possible culprit through handwriting analysis, has broadened the scope of the probe. However, the Gregory Affair is more than a quest for justice. It symbolizes persistent optimism a ray of hope that one day, the truth would step out of obscurity, unmasking the concealed dark truths that have lingered in hiding for too long. Even though the mystery persists, the aspiration for justice for young Gregory Villamin remains alive and vibrant. In the symphony of life, few finales are as enigmatic as that of Jean-Marie Leclerc, the esteemed French Baroque violinist and composer. Leclerc was not just a virtuoso of the violin, he was a maestro of the arts. His life was a harmonious blend of diverse roles, a dancer, a ballet master, and a composer, bounding effortlessly between disciplines with the elegance of a ballet dancer and the accuracy of a concert violinist. His talent resonated far and wide to the point where Louis XV himself appointed Leclerc as the director of music of the chapel and the apartments, an honor that amplified his musical genius to the French royal court. However, Leclerc's life was not a seamless melody. His personal life was a discordant symphony, 
rife with estrangement, disputes, and ultimately, tragedy. The peak of his personal conflict materialized in 1764. What should have been a celebration of his 67th birthday instead marked the end of his life in the most horrifying manner. The streets of Paris, typically filled with the hum of life and music, were hushed by the gruesome revelation of Leclerc's lifeless body. The virtuoso's life was abruptly ended, extinguished by the cold steel of a blade. The man who breathed life into the violin was forever hushed, his body discovered brutally murdered under circumstances as perplexing as a cryptic musical score. The final bars of Leclerc's life were not a harmonious coda, they were a discordant conclusion that reverberated with the unsettling resonance of a murder mystery. As the news of his demise spread, Paris grieved the loss of its musical virtuoso, and the world of music was deprived of a maestro. Leclerc's life was a symphony of melodies, but his demise, a cacophony of unsolved mysteries. When a luminary meets a tragic fate, the roster of suspects often mirrors their complex life. In the scenario of Jean-Marie Leclerc, a celebrated French Baroque violinist and composer, three individuals were the primary focus of the investigation. Since he was found just outside of his front door, stabbed three times in his chest and stomach, detectives surmised that the culprit was someone Leclerc would have known. The first suspect was the gardener. Could he just be an innocent bystander who unfortunately discovered the horrific scene? Or rather a ruthless murderer attempting to deflect suspicion? As the first to find Leclerc's lifeless body, an event that would indelibly mark him, it was only natural to question his innocence. Did he simply stumble upon the crime, or was he in fact the perpetrator? This remains a mystery. The plot thickens with Leclerc's estranged wife, not only his partner in life but also his engraver. Their relationship was anything but smooth, and their separation only added to the rising smoke of suspicion. She had both motive and opportunity, but did she possess the means? Finally, we consider the quarrelsome nephew. As we know, family spats can spiral into chaos, and in Leclerc's situation, it might have led to his demise. The nephew was known to have had heated disagreements with Leclerc, incidents fiery enough to raise suspicions. Could a family dispute intensify to a lethal climax? Each suspect was tied to Leclerc, each had a plausible reason to wish him harm, and each was under the investigative spotlight. But who, if any, transformed their malice into a fatal act? The bonds Leclerc had with each suspect were complicated, entwined with both personal and professional associations. The gardener, the wife, the nephew, the stage was now set for investigators to begin the next act on this murderous menage. In the convoluted narrative of Leclerc's downfall, the suspects were as fascinating as the victim himself. An unresolved murder becomes a haunting refrain echoing through the ages. This rings particularly true in the case of Jean-Marie Leclerc, a virtuoso violinist and composer from the French Baroque era. Over two centuries have passed since his mysterious end, yet the details of his death are still shrouded in a veil of uncertainty. After his murder in 1764, an investigation pointed towards three possible culprits. In a world without cameras or home security systems, clues and evidence were as sparse as electricity. Despite the cloud of suspicion that hung over the three suspects, none were definitively proven guilty, leaving the murder unsolved. This enduring mystery has bred a plethora of theories over time. Suggestions range from crimes of passion to calculated revenge plots, and even fanciful theories of conspiracy considering Leclerc's status in the musical world. The absence of a definitive conclusion only serves to fuel the legend of Leclerc. The narrative of his life, distinguished by his unmatched musical talent and death, shrouded in mystery, has fascinated historians, music aficionados, and crime enthusiasts alike. His story has inspired authors of novels, playwrights, and composers of operas, adding a touch of allure to his already impressive legacy. In the end, whether the cause was a crime of passion, an act of revenge, or a dark conspiracy, the truth lies buried with Leclerc. His untimely demise, akin to a suspenseful cliffhanger, continues to arouse curiosity and speculation. Leclerc's music continues to captivate, but the mystery of his death continues to baffle. As his mesmerizing tunes echo through the ages, so too does the riddle of his unsolved murder. The mystery serves as an eerie counterpoint to his timeless compositions, adding a captivating layer of intrigue. Leclerc's life was a symphony of melodies, his death a riddle. The enduring legacy of Jean-Marie Leclerc, the celebrated French Baroque violinist and composer, stands testament to this. His life was a symphony echoing through concert halls and music academies. 
his compositions a testament to his musical genius. As the founder of the French Violin School, a prestigious institution that has shaped numerous accomplished musicians, his role and contributions to classical music were profound. His works ranged from operas to concertos, each piece showcasing the depth and breadth of his musical prowess, each note touching the hearts of music lovers around the world. His influence went beyond his compositions. As a man of stature, appointed the director of music of the chapel and the apartments by Louis XV himself, Leclerc held sway over the music of his era. Could jealousy have been the motive for murder? Or maybe someone looking to replace his role as the director? His violent end, found stabbed to death in Paris and the ongoing mystery surrounding it, adds a layer of intrigue to his enduring legacy. His story continues to captivate, his music continues to inspire, and the riddle of his death continues to fascinate. Thus, the melody of Leclerc's life plays on, a haunting tune that echoes through the corridors of time. In the grand concert of existence, every note, every melody, and every finale reverberates powerfully. This is profoundly exemplified by the life led and the enigma surrounding the end of the musical maestro, Jean-Marie Leclerc, who was a master of the violin and a pivotal figure in the French violin school. His tragic murder adds a chilling coda to his illustrious life, leaving a mystery that still puzzles and intrigues. In the tranquility of 1976, in a serene French town, a notorious character from the dark chapters of World War II ironically met a bone-chilling end. The man's name was Joachim Piper, a figure whose past was as tainted as human history. A ruthless SS officer, Piper's name was not synonymous with mercy, but rather with brutal leadership and the acceptance of the worst war crimes. Piper's name is forever marked in the pages of history through his involvement in the Malmedy Massacre, a horrific event that resulted in the heartless killing of American war prisoners during the Battle of the Bulge. Convicted as a war criminal for his role in this horror, Piper was initially sentenced to death. However, destiny chose a different path. His sentence was changed to life imprisonment, and eventually he was released, a liberty which was arguably undeserved. After his release, Piper sought haven in the least expected place, France, the very country his forces once oppressed. Here he led a calm life, far removed from the turbulent battles and horrendous crimes of his past. His work with automobile companies provided a mundane existence, a stark contrast to his former torturous life. Still, his past never truly left him. His reputation trailed him, a spectral echo of the atrocities he had committed. It was here in this peaceful French town that Piper's past eventually caught up with him. In the year he was discovered dead, his life snuffed out under puzzling circumstances. The cause, a savage homicide, executed by unidentified individuals. The motive, that dear listener still remains an enigma to this day. But with a sordid history such as Peepers, the suspects and reasons were countless. The past doesn't always stay buried. Unraveling the mystery of Piper's demise warrants a deep dive into his notorious past. Joachim Piper's tale is not of humble beginnings, but a swift ascendancy within an entity synonymous with terror and atrocities, the Schutzstaffel, otherwise known as the SS. Born into a lineage rooted in military service and nationalist ideology, Piper was groomed for an existence draped in uniform from his early years. He embarked on his journey within the Hitler Youth, a forge that molded the psyche of many German youth during the emergence of the Third Reich. His ambition and commitment did not stay hidden. Piper swiftly captivated the attention of Heinrich Himmler, one of Nazi Germany's most influential men. As Himmler's aide, Piper stood at the heart of the Nazi power nexus, and it was here that he began to embody the pitiless leadership ethos that would earn him notoriety. His true nature, however, shone through on the grisly battlefield of World War II. Serving as a tank commander in the Waffen SS, he earned a reputation for implacable aggression and an alarming tolerance for war crimes. The Malmedy massacre is a stark reminder of this. This appalling event witnessed countless American POWs brutally assassinated under Piper's orders. The sheer cruelty of this act stunned even the battle-hardened warriors of the Second World War. In the war's aftermath, Piper was convicted under command responsibility for the Malmedy massacre. Although his death sentence was later converted to life imprisonment, his past was inescapable. Upon his release, he secured employment with car companies and embraced a life of relative anonymity in France. This individual, a living emblem of Nazi atrocities, led a quiet life on parole. However, his past was a ticking time bomb, 
On a fateful day in July, that bomb detonated. The year was 1976, and the setting, Travis, France. A peaceful, modest village where Joachim Piper had settled to live his post-war life in relative obscurity. Nevertheless, as we are aware, the past has a tendency to catch up with even the most elusive figures. Now picture this scene. The sun had barely started to peek over the horizon, casting long, ominous shadows that played on the walls of Piper's charming French house. It seemed like a normal day, but unbeknownst to everyone, Destiny's wheels were already in motion, setting the scene for a crime that would spark a fierce controversy. The morning calm cracked when flames broke out from Piper's house, a ferocious blaze that devoured everything in its way. The once peaceful abode was now a fiery spectacle, a symbol of destruction that mirrored the horrors of a bygone era. When the smoke finally settled and the ashes cooled, all that was left was the charred framework of a house and the lifeless body of Joachim Piper. Upon searching the remnants of the smoldering home, Piper's charred remains were found entrenched in a confined room holding a pistol and rifle. Cause of death? Suffocation. His death was as theatrical as the man's life had been. Piper death. A blazing finale that seemed almost poetic for a man who existed and prospered in the crucible of war. It was as if the flames had devoured not just the man but the remnants of a somber past that refused to fade away. The crime scene was a mystery in itself. Among the wreckage, investigators found no signs of a fight, no indicators of forced entry. It was as if death had simply strolled through the unlocked door and claimed its prize. But was it an accident or was it a homicide? The question hung in the air, as tangible as the smoke's lingering scent. The circumstances were as clouded as the smoke that had engulfed the house. The only certainty was that Joachim Piper, the notorious SS officer, the man who had once wielded power in a war-ravaged world, had met an untimely but well-deserved demise. In a fiery end befitting a man of war, Piper was snuffed out. But who ignited the flame? Following the demise of Piper, a flurry of conjecture took the center stage. Who possessed the motive, the capacity, and the chance to eliminate a former SS officer living in the shadows of the rural areas in France? Was it the anti-Nazi activists, the discontented local inhabitants, or an individual nursing a personal vendetta? In the aftermath of the Inferno, the anti-Nazi group named the Avengers claimed responsibility for the murderous blaze. However, with any evidence burnt to ashes, no individuals were ever arrested. Some detectives weren't even convinced that it was Piper who died in the flames. Regardless, the fiery conclusion of Joachim Piper is an enigma that continues to perplex the world. Despite investigations and a claim to rights, the identity of the individuals responsible for Piper's end remains a conundrum. Piper, in his lifetime, shifted from a heartless SS officer to a contentious figure in death, yet his mystery persists. His perpetrator might have muted him, but they were unable to wipe out his ominous legacy. Envision a family of four evaporating into the ether, barely leaving behind a trace of their existence. This is the bewildering chronicle of the Goddard family's vanishment. In France's core, September 1999, the Goddards, an apparently typical household, disappeared from their home, never to be found. The head, Yves Goddard, an esteemed doctor, his second spouse, Marie France, and their two young children, Camille and Marius, were seemingly consumed by the abyss. Their absence, abrupt and mystifying, left no signs of prepared trips or goodbyes, just an uncanny vacuity where a family formerly dwelled. Acquaintances, kin and neighbors were left wrestling with the eerie silence that supplanted the usual commotion of the Goddard residence. The story of their vanishment could induce chills in even the most stoic investigator. Eve Goddard was last beheld sailing with his progeny. His wife's conspicuous absence from this journey would later loom ominously over the investigation. As the hunt for the Goddards escalated, suspicion started enveloping Eve. A dreadful find in his van, blood and morphine traces. Was this a hint to their vanishing or a grotesque coincidence? Over time, the enigma deepened as objects linked to the family were unearthed in disparate locales. It seemed as though an entity was purposefully dispersing clues, leading to more queries than resolutions. Several witnesses claimed to have seen Eves and the two children in the few days after their initial vanishing act. One owner even testified they rented a place from September 7th through the 14th for them. From there, the boat the family rented, the Nick and the family seemed to disappear into the watery abyss. 
Over the span of eight years, many objects and personal effects washed ashore or found their way to land. From credit cards and licenses to clothes and checkbooks, a variety of clues came to be scattered around the waterfront communities, almost like a trail of breadcrumbs. Still, even these ghastly discoveries couldn't illuminate the fate of the remaining Goddards. Their sudden absence was eerie enough, but the surfacing of these peculiar clues, they transformed the case into one of the most confounding mysteries of the past century, as the Goddard clan's final actions were meticulously dissected by detectives, an eerie tale began to unfold. The family abode, previously a haven of joy and warmth, had transformed into a bleak crime scene. Analysts discovered blood residue, a sinister indication of the calamity that struck the Goddards. In a shocking revelation, the blood found at the home was that of the missing wife, Marie France. Was the impromptu sailing excursion a simple getaway from the scene of the crime? It presented a silent testimony of a morbid destiny, a horrific scene depicted in hues of red and despair. However, the trail of disturbing evidence didn't conclude there. As if torn from a thrilling whodunit novel, diverse objects started appearing along Brittany's northern coast and the sea. These possessions associated with the vanished family hinted at a calculated dissemination, a mystery-laden path guiding detectives on a futile pursuit across the rocky shoreline and the unpredictable ocean. Among the discovered belongings were personal items revealing a spine-chilling image of the absent family. One such find was a skull fragment pulled from a seashell boat. Upon examination, it was identified as Camille's, a heartbreaking discovery that screamed for justice. However, each find was like a spectral murmur, a muted cry reverberating across the tumultuous sea and the wind-lashed cliffs of Brittany. Then in 2006, seven years after their disappearance, a significant lead in the case was discovered. However, this unsettling revelation created more problems than solutions. Each new piece of evidence further intensified the mystery. Where was the Goddard family? The final appearance of Dr. Yves Godard carried an aura of mystery as thick as the enigmas he left in his wake. This cryptic French physician, recognized by many yet comprehended by a select few, was last seen embarking on a family nautical journey. Yet, his companionship was as baffling as the enigma of his vanishing. Accompanying Goddard were his two young kids, oblivious to life's conundrums, while his wife, his sworn life partner, was notably missing. This discrepancy prompts us to ask, where was Mrs. Goddard? Why didn't she join the family voyage? Was her absence due to a lack of interest in seafaring, or was there a darker motive? The disappearance of the Goddard family transcends a typical vanishing act. It's a multi-layered, convoluted riddle, challenging even the most experienced detectives. As Goddard and his progeny disappeared into the horizon, they left an ocean of unanswered queries in their wake. As their ship was engulfed by the sea, one is left to ask, was this an ill-fated family excursion or did a more diabolical purpose lurk beneath the surface? Years rolled by and the mystery of the Goddard family's vanishing act turned icier, yet conjectures were simmering. Intricate, mystifying cases like this one naturally spur rampant hypotheses. One premise, garnering notable attention, suggested an accomplice's involvement to elucidate the deliberate dispersion of the family's belongings. A bone-chilling prospect. The possibility of someone aiding this dreadful occurrence, masterfully masking it as an accident, challenges the interpretation of every clue, questioning its placement by a malevolent hand. Another supposition proposed that Eves Goddard, the patriarch and primary accused, orchestrated this grand illusion. Some contended that the blood and morphine remnants in his vehicle were part of an intricate scheme to feign their demise and begin afresh. However, the ghastly revelation found in 2006 undermined this proposition. A fraction of theorists maintained that the family was covertly inhabiting a remote corner of the globe under assumed identities. This unsubstantiated notion, fueled by the innate human yearning for a silver lining, was a denial of such a terrible occurrence. Then came more erratic, ominous theories haunting your dreams tales of covert fraternities, government plots, and supernatural phenomena. Although the theories sent chills down the spine, the truth remained veiled. In 2006, a macabre find led to a significant stride in the Goddard family's unsettling vanishing case. Years advanced, the enigma deepened until six bone fragments from a femur and tibia were discovered. A painstaking examination verified these as belonging to Eve Goddard, the patriarch of the family. 
This shocking discovery sparked a fresh barrage of speculation yet falling short of any definitive conclusion. The lingering queries were, what was Eve's real fate? How did his remains disperse across Brittany's north coast and the ocean? Moreover, the eeriest inquiry of them all, what transpired with his wife and kids? The Goddard family paradox was officially concluded in 2012. Closure is a strange term indeed in this context. The probe ceased, records archived, and the relentless quest for truth put on hold. But did it result in genuine closure? For the observers, the hopefuls, and primarily for those who held the Goddards dear, closure remained distant. The official cessation failed to uncover the much sought answers, to decode the enigma shrouding their vanishing, or to unmask the truth behind the blood evidence, the morphine in Eve's vehicle, and the strewn personal belongings. The Goddard family's vanishing is a chilling testament to a lack of concrete evidence perpetuating a puzzle. A tantalizing mystery wrapped in layers of supposition, uncertainty, and intrigue. Whether it was a heart-rending mishap, a premeditated homicide, or an entirely different occurrence, the Goddard family's vanishing persists as one of the most disturbing unresolved mysteries to this day. The concluding judgment appears to be a chilling silence, a resonance of queries that may forever remain unanswered.